two. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Odoo Live webinar. Good as always to have you with us. The time is now 11 a.m. on this foggy summer morning in San Francisco, and today we'll be taking a look about deploying and customizing Odoo. My name is Todd Farnham, a digital marketer here at Odoo San Francisco, and I'll be hosting today's session, which will be presented by my colleague, Chigar. Hey, guys. And we'll also be joined by Clark, who will be managing the Q&A. Hi, everyone. Now, before we begin, I just want to go over a few procedural items for those unfamiliar with this format. Uh, today's presentation will take about 30 to 45 minutes, uh, which will leave about 20 minutes for the Q&A session at the end. Uh, throughout Jigar's presentation, Clark will be answering your questions in the chat box to the right of the video, so keep your questions coming throughout the presentation and we'll do our best to answer them there. Uh, we will also hold on to questions so we can go over them together in more detail during the Q&A after the presentation. Uh, and also know that today's session is being recorded, including the Q&A. So you can review it at any time by revisiting this page's URL. Um, and this is the same as the access link that you, were, you received by email when you signed up for the webinar. And if you got here by another means, just copy the URL of the page. Now, if you're interested in future webinars, subscribe to, your, to our YouTube channel to stay up to date uh, on what we broadcast. We broadcast several times a week on a variety of topics. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jigar. All right, Todd, thank you so much. So let's get going. And can you switch me to screen? All right, Done. perfect. Thank you so much. So uh, as Todd mentioned, we will be talking about deploying and customizing Odoo. Uh, there are a lot of uh, things that people uh, either guess or they don't know or they do wrong while, while customizing Odoo or while deploying Odoo. So I'll try to clear some air and I'll try to give uh, some of the information that might be helpful uh, helpful to you uh, while deploying and customizing Guru. Of course, uh, we don't have ample time to dig into every single detail of this, but I'll try to scratch the surface and I'll try to give, give you the best guidelines and and uh, things to understand to start. All right, so let's get going. And can you switch to main screen? We're on the main screen. Presentation, all oh, right, great. Uh, right, let me get started. Uh, Up at the top right, you can present. Yeah, oh yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So uh, these are the basic uh, outline that we will following today: deploying Guru, customizing Guru using Studio, and behind the Studio, we will all, we will also be covering what happens when you use Studio. So if something goes wrong, how can you correct it, or how you can recover, and things to take care while doing the Studio, and what are the things that you can do stu with the Studio. Uh, security in Guru. This is very much important topic. Uh, uh, most of the online users or, or, or on-premises users don't know about uh, Udo security correctly and they mess up with the security badly and that in turn result in a bad database. So we will talk about basics about the security that will give you an uh, outline uh, how to, how, on how to, use it, how to use an Udo security. And then we will see uh, basics about customizing uh, Udo website and e-commerce uh, that will help you, you know, understanding uh, on how to customize Udo website. All right, so let's get going. So let's talk about deploying Udo. All right. So when it comes to deploying, when you choose Udo, uh, and when you you know talk to your partner or when you talk to your salesperson, you get Udo. Uh, you decide. You make one decision that is very important. That are you are you going to host it by yourself or are you gonna use our Udo source version? So when you make this decision, this is very important decision for you. Uh, when you when you when you are in decision, when you are in decision making pro process, now let's say you you dig into Udo and you decided to go self-hosted Udo, and if you if you decided to go self-hosted Udo, then you, you need to understand that there will be a lot of consequences that you have to you have to follow when you decide to do self-hosting. Consequences like uh, managing uh, disaster recovery, managing your server, managing a core, managing different version of the core, managing customization. And so on and so forth. Uh, that is a part of self-hosted things. That uh, self-hosted Udo, if you if you do by yourself, like while if you do Udo SaaS, what you do is you don't care about any of those uh, any of those uh, problems. R rather, you just get your own URL and you get your own instance, which you can access just by typing in URL. Uh, we have 99.99 percent of the uptime. Uh, so you get and also you get a free upgrades when you choose an Udo SaaS. So 
whenever you are making this uh, whenever you are doing you are doing decision making process of choosing Udo sauce or hosted you have to be very careful choosing this Mo uh, in my experience i have i have seen a lot of people a lot of people making mistakes uh, uh, by choosing self hosted version by assuming that they know that they can handle all this complexity of complexity of managing server and you know dealing with the disaster recovery or there are people who who even don't are not prepared with the disaster recovery when it comes to self hosted servers so uh, those are the things that you have to be real careful when you when you when you go for self hosted self hosted udu and uh, while Udo sauce, of course, you don't have to worry about this. And as I, as uh, Fabian mentioned, uh, mentioned in his uh, previous uh, uh, community session, uh, we are also going to offer Udo a platform as a service, which will be a pass. So that will be also a new offering, which uh, is uh, supposed to be ready in October or somewhere. So you may ha you may also have that option where you can host Udo by uh, where you can host Udo by yourself and you you don't have to worry about infrastructure you don't have to worry about disaster recovery you don't have to worry about any of the database or server management that will be taken care of by Uru. what you do is just host Uru, and we provide platform uh, pre-configured Uru with all all performance measure uh, one of the other thing that has to be taken care of when you self-host Uru is you have to worry about performance now if you host it and if you don't care about performance then you are going to you know experience very bad performance and you may complain that Udo is bad software but no Udo is not bad software the the thing that is missing is your Udo that is deployed is not and configured is not optimized to to your usage of course every single uh, deployment has a different usage and every single deployment requires different kind of configuration so you have to be really careful while making this decision if you are really not into technical side if you re if you really don't know how to manage a server how to manage a linux server if you if you really don't know what i'm talking right now then you you just don't don't assume and don't go for self hosted version yeah sometimes installing i mean installing udo is very easy because when you get a one time ins a one click installer like for, for windows for linux you get one one click installer you install udo and you are all set but uh, that is not all about it. There are a lot of different uh, uh, responsibility comes when you host Uru by yourself. So uh, that is very important decision to make. So when you choose uh, to go with Uru, uh, choose what you want to do. You want to host or you want to go on the SaaS. Now let's say you decided to host by yourself and uh, and let's say you have Udu partnerships signed with Udu and you got source code and everything. So. Uh, that is the next topic that we will will be talking that is general tips on deploying Udo server so common mistakes that i have i have experience uh, while i'm working with uh, different partners that most of the partner are not optimizing their server when they deploy a server so when i say optimizing what are the things has to be optimized uh, how do we optimize uh, what are the different options that we can use for optimizations uh, they they are completely not aware of this uh, I mean, all these things are very well documented, but they are not aware of this, and then they will do the wrong deployment, and in turn resulting into bad performance, and they and then it creates a bad customer experience. So I'll try to explain uh, basics and what are the things that you have to be really careful when you deploy in Udo. So, uh, general and in a, in a general tip, uh, first thing that you wanna you first thing you wanna do is you wanna do the hardware hardware sizing. Now you can do hardware sizing by going on to our page of, uh, you can go to our page, uh, udo.com slash 10.0, and then there is and deploy deployment section. So if you go udo.com slash 10.0, slash as you can see on my screen, uh, and there is a deploying Udo section. So if you go deploying Udo section, there's a call HTTP section. So when it comes to HTTP section, uh, on top of that, there is an explanation under built-in server uh, section. There is explanation on how to size your hardware and what are the things to take care of while ha while sizing your hardware resources for Udo. Uh, I'll talk about those in detail. Uh, I'm just giving you a link uh, reference and uh, in advance, uh, which you can follow. All right. So uh, let's say you decide to choose an Udo, and with Udo, when you when you deploy Udo, you get you have to worry about two things, backend and the front end. Now, of course, Udo is a multi-tenant, uh, three-tier architecture. That means you have application server and you have backend server, which is database server where we store uh, 
did where we store data and you do uh, postgres is a real workhorse uh, workhorse we where we store all the data and where all the you know all the business logic uh, related data will be stored of course applications are will, will be running your business logic business processes on your data so the one of the biggest mistake that usually uh, uh, i have observed is people will install Udo server and they will install a Postgres server. Of course, using the latest uh, Postgres server is advised, so you can take 9.5 uh, or 9.6, whatever the latest uh, Postgres server is available to your operating system. So let's say you installed 9.6 and you start using Udo on a uh, basic, on a basic uh, Postgres server. So that's the first mistake right there, that basic Postgres server is basic, as I, as I mentioned, it does not, it does not come uh, the Postgres that is installed out of box is not optimized for you know optimized for the performance. It will, it will just give you a basic performance. It will work. That's all. I mean, you will not give a real real power of real power out of it. And there are a very good, very big cloud based application cloud based softwares who use this Postgres, and it runs like a charm. So first thing with the Postgres that you need to do is you need to optimize your Postgres. The basic thing that I can guide you to uh, to do to do and optimizing optimization of the postgres is to use a pg tune so if you use a pg tune pg tune is very handy tool where you just say this is a database version that i'm using this is the linux or a windows operating system this is the in 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 case of udo it will be a web application and then you say a ram that is on your computer and number of connection uh, that you want to allow and let's say my my ram is uh, 16 gigs and number of connection I want to allow is 1204 connections when I say generate it's pretty handy that it prepares and it prepares and list of configuration that needs correction in your postgres file so you go to your postgres configuration file as you can see on my screen and you can copy and paste this parameter this will make a big difference on your postgres performance to begin with of course, then you there are a lot of other things that you can do to do uh, to take care with the to you know to improve performance of your Postgres. But that is the best and that is the most important things that you have to do. Optimize your Postgres first. Now, once your Postgres is optimized and when you are running Udo Server uh, out of the box, Udo Server which you get is not optimized again. It is it is there for testing. It's there for you know demonstration purpose purpose only. So when you run application server, your application server will be running into multi-threading mode or in a simple threading mode uh, where where it can it you know it can handle up to four or five user and after four or five user it will go slow. It's not optimized for it's not optimized for performance. It's not optimized for for you know giving you a best result out of the Udo server. So out of the box, Udo will is not optimized. So what we what do we recommend is to do a multiprocessing. So multiprocessing is an uh, modern concept of using your fancy hardware. Usually, uh, when you buy your hardware, your hardware will have let's say uh, six core or twelve core, which is which which will be uh, twelve thread or twenty four thread, which gives an which is really powerful server. Uh, and then you have a you know RAM for that, and of course uh, you will have a storage. Uh, for your for your Uru server. So, what is multiprocessing uh, in in compared to multi-threading? So, when you do multi-threading, what it, it does is it creates a simple thread, and in, in simple thread it creates a child thread, and it just runs the processes. Now, multi-threading is not an optimal usage. It, it does not uh, do optimal usage of you know multi-core processor when you have multi -pro multi-core processor six core or twelve core. Uh, multi-threading will not be uh, will not make a maximum usage of your hardware there could be situation that uh, some cores are overloaded and some cores are sitting idle and there could be situations like that and that's not optimal usage of your money and your hardware that you have bought so in that case we recommend using a multi-processing in multi-processing is uh, it's a way of you know using your hardware in maximum maximum work power uh, let's say you have, if you have six core, then six core can have a twelve worker. Worker. Now, what is worker? Worker is like a predefined processes which, when when server gets a request, it it gives the worker, and worker will process a request in a simple term. So, worker is an process uh, process worker, which takes and user request process and it processes data and then returns the data. 
now multi processing usually has some kind of a some kind of a rule of thumb uh, some kind of a formulas that you need to follow so rule of thumbs for <coughs> for multi processing are uh, it's defined uh, it's defined over here on the performance tip uh, I'll, I'll i'll ask uh, clark to share this url sh uh, url with you so so you clark when you yeah, I'll yeah, just search yeah that what is that uh, uh, you, performance uh, tips and tricks performance tips and tricks yeah so that's a presentation by Olivia. Udu, yeah. yeah yeah so it's a you will find and with this title performance as a big title yeah, 399? Yep. yep. All right, thank you. All right, yeah, I'll drop that in the chat. So you will be getting this uh, slide, and this slide has an information about hardware, si hardware sizing, how you can do the hardware sizing when you are when you're going to deploy in Udo. So as you can see, when you when you, when you you decide to go for multiprocessing, of course, multiprocessing requires a worker calculation. Worker, again, as I said, worker is a process worker. When you send some requests and they process this, and then the worker processes will respond back and so on and so forth. So they are like a background worker, they are like a software load balancer for optimally optim optimal usage of your uh, of your hardware. So to activate a worker on your on your Udo server, what you need to do is on your terminal, on your Udo configuration file, there's a parameter called hyper, uh, worker. So when you define a worker, worker as a non, non uh, zero number, so if you define a posit any positive number, your server will run into multi-processing mode. Of course, this is a wrong calculation. I don't have a 12 thread. I have a four core processor, which can take up to eight threads, so, which is wrong. So I'll explain you how to how to calculate a worker. So workers can be calculated as uh, with the formula that you can see on my screen. One CPU requires two worker, which is one for processing and one for re recycling the process request. So per CPU, you need a two workers. And minimum recommendation is having a six work six worker. Now, why is minimum six worker is recommended? Because most of the modern browser allows a six parallel HTTP request. So from one browser, you can run six parallel which HTTP requests doing something. And that way you can run six parallel connection uh, from one browser window if you want to. And that corresponds to uh, six pool size, so minimum pool size is 16, and of course maximum you can increase more and more and more uh, depending on your need. One of the example that is given here is, uh, let's say if dedicated RAM, do you, how to get a maximum RAM? So how to get a maximum worker, you get a, a minimum six, and maximum is your dedicated RAM for Udo and divided by worker soft uh, memory limit, which what is worker soft memory limit, which I'll explain in a bit. So you say RAM divided by soft limit, and you get a number of worker. Now, remember each worker in Udo is capable of taking six to seven uh, process, six to seven requests per second. So this, each each worker, so let's say if you have a 24 worker, 24 worker can take up to six to seven parallel requests on the server. So number of workers into a number of requests per second into worker is number of total number of requests that can be taken by Udo server. So you have to decide how many active users you are going to have. One of the simpler example of deployment is here on my screen, as you can see, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a backend plus frontend server where we have 16 core, 32 threads, Xeon server E5, which uh, clocked at say 2.6 GHz and which has 64 gigabytes of RAM. So on this we are running twenty. Uh, on this we are running 20 workers. Now whenever we are running a 20 workers, 20 workers into five, so it can take up to 100 users parallel. So it can take up to 100 active users and it can take 10,000 visit, visit, visitors per day. So for a for a best performance, this is one of the advised uh, one of the advised hardware sizing. Now let's say number of users increases. Now this 100 user that you see on my screen are backend user. They are not a website user. Of course, they are doing some live transaction data onto onto the backend. So that that corresponds to the active users in a backend. Now let's say this is another uh, deployment architecture where we are scaling a so uh, where, where we are scaling a hardware, where we are we are introducing a three Udo server. So as you can see, there are three Udo server. Udo this three you see in the middle on my screen are three different Udo server where each server has a ten worker, and each server configuration has a four core. So you have quad core CPU which have a. Th uh, Eight thread and which is a Xeon E5 lower, of course a lower 
core CPU and clocked at uh, 2.7 uh, GHz. So this is one of the uh, recommended uh, deployment. Now here, you, as you could see in this deployment, this deployment is very powerful. It can take up to 300 parallel active users. It And this will require a software load balancer like HA proxy or uh, varnish. You need to it's, you need to have those kind of software load balancer which uh, which uh, redirects your traffic into different Udo server and then you have a database server running in the backend which is running on a separate server, uh, of course, which is running on a network file system. Uh, which, have, which has a six core, 12 thread, zero new five clocked at 2.5 GHz and 64 gigs of RAM. And you can introduce as many uh, Udo server as you need. It depends on your on your need. But as I said, each, remember the simple thing, each worker can take up to six to five uh, active users. Sorry, six to seven active users. So number of active users that you have should be multiplied with the worker and that's the hardware sizing you need. So that's how you will size your hardware whenever you are going whenever you are going to uh, deploy Udo with and multiprocessing. All right, and uh, of course, each uh, based on our experience, uh, ninety percent, eighty percent. So if you go to this deploying uh, deploying page, deploying page has a very nice formula where it um, how to do a memory sizing. So memory sizing can be done by we consider twenty percent of the requests are uh, heavy requests. So out of 100% of the requests that we receive on the server, 20% requests are very, very heavy, and 80% requests are simpler, re simpler requests. Now, the 20% of the rec uh, requests that we need will we uh, we'll, we'll consume around one gigabytes of RAM, while the 20%, while the 80% of the requests, which are uh, which are simpler ones, uh, will take around 150 uh, megabytes of RAM. So this is the needed RAM formula: light worker ratio into light worker estimate and heavy worker ratio into heavy worker estimate uh, and multiplied by worker that will be a dedicated ram that is needed by udu remember this will be a dedicated this cannot be shared so let's say if you if this formula gives you an four gigabytes of ram then it's a dedicated for for udu so for other resources you need more ram of course now one of the common mistake people do is that when they do multi-processing they think more ram is good but not necessarily more ram is is not good because the uh, the memory limit that we define on the worker multiprocessing limit is it's for uh, each worker so every single worker will have a limitation that they can only take this many uh, memory now let's assume there are six worker are running and they are taking uh, two gigabytes each then your memory can be you know overloaded pretty fast so more more ram is not good i mean that idea of using more ram it will be good is not it's not something that is advised uh, follow this idea. Of course, you have to do sampling and you have to uh, observe the performance and then you can adjust this number minor if you want to uh, adjust, but uh, adding, let's say, once, uh, instead of one gigabyte, if you add like 10 gigabytes over this, will, it's not something that you will give you, uh, you know, best result probably. So that's the, that's the basic formula that you could follow for har hardware sizing. Of course, the the sample configuration is given here based on this uh, slides that is already shared to you in the chat that you can follow, right? So that is about multi-threading and multi-processing. Of course, multi-processing is again, as I said, uh, it's very powerful. It can control up to it can control your hardware in hardware resources like CPU, memory, and also your your storage. So you can control all those using multi-processing, and you can take you can take maximum out of your hardware resources. As I say, do's and don'ts. Uh, don'ts are don't more RAM is not. It, you know the idea of having more RAM. Using more RAM is good. Is not. It's not good. Uh, use what is suggested and then sample the data. If you feel performance issue, then adjust the value minor and then you will you will be able to solve it. And again. One of the most important do's is uh, optimize your Postgres out of box. Udo is not for deployment; it's for testing only, and it's for development only. So when you get Udo, when you deploy Udo, do multi-processing deployment, and that will give you a best result. Uh, Clark, if you have any question, go ahead and ask me. Uh, okay, we just be. have one question, uh, mm -hmm. or perhaps comment from this section. This mm -hmm. is from Axel Mendoza, um, and he's asking if I can just pull up that question. Uh, when using Postgres Bouncer or PG Bouncer mm -hmm. uh, with polling mode transaction, mm -hmm. the Odoo bus stops working properly since it's not supported by that PG Bouncer feature. Uh, and he thinks that it's the most useful uh, one for stopping 
uh, getting max connection errors from Postgres? Uh, I mean, if as you mentioned, it says that PG Bouncer is stopping, so it could be limitation from PG Bouncer. So probably something the library has this limitation that we cannot come over. And for for a streaming replica and for you know clustering of a database, we do use PG Pool PG Pool two. So probably you want to use PG Pool two for clustering of data, uh, database backends, and so on. So for bouncer error, you probably want to check their library or you, if it's a, if you think if it's a bug, then go to the GitHub and file a bug, and that would probably help you. Yeah. Um. Let's see, uh, do you have time to take one more question yeah, about sure. this uh, topic of deployment? Sure. Uh, here's one from Mark Lejour. He's mm -hmm. asking if you can talk briefly about Docker and do try to keep it brief because we need, need to keep moving along to fit inside time here. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not a Docker expert. I cannot tell you anything, but what I can tell you is you can go to nightly.udu.com uh, and over there there's a separate section for Docker. Uh, Docker image and instructions are there on Docker, Docker Hub, and there's a GitHub repository with a Udo GitHub repository with a Docker. So that's what I can best guide you. I'm sorry, I'm not a Docker expert, so that's that's all I can tell you. Okay, great. Right. Yeah, let's move along to the next section here. If all, we right. Can. all right, all uh, right, all right. So moving ahead, that was there are a few do do's and don't you do uh, again to uh, briefly repeat what I did, what I mentioned. Optimize your Postgres, use multiprocessing, and do size your hardware. And one of the important thing is use an SSDs uh, for a faster performance. Because in Udo, uh, the file store, the data file store is not in a database. We recommend use, using the external file store, which gives you a better performance. So SSDs is something that you want to do. Next thing, important configurations, uh, important Udo configurations. Important Udo configurations are uh, when when you say udo dot when you run your server you can always say help uh, udo hyphen bean help and over there there are a few important configurations these are the multiprocessing one that you as you can see on my screen and other ones are no database list if you want to hide a database list this is something that we do recommend uh, hide your database list uh, of course you don't want to expose your customer database to everybody so you can hide using no database list uh, and of course, when it comes to deploying Udo, we do recommend using Nginx. So when you uh, when you deploy an Nginx, uh, you want to do uh, proxy mode true. So there's a proxy mode available. Then, then, then you have DB filter. So DB filter is very important because this will filter your database. Uh, this will filter your database when you try to log in. So let's say right now, I have a huge list of database that I'm running right now. But let's say I just want to run right now one database, SAS 15 to be exposed. So I can expose SAS 15 database only. So when I run my server like this, uh, when I run my server like this, my browser will only show me one database and it will not show me more than one database. So you can use a database uh, filter options uh, for filtering your database. Uh, so those are the things that you, you probably want to take care of. Uh, proxy mode, use Nginx for hiding a Udo behind the proxy. That way you can control, you can use a load, load balancer you can distribute your traffic correctly, and you can use a uh, maximum out of Udo resource. Uh, then next is choosing an email server. Well, uh, Udo, Udo by default comes with an idea of implementing email alias and uh, catch-all idea, catch-all mechanism of email server. So if you are choosing any email uh, server to be used with your Udo, make sure your Udo has uh, email alias and catch-all feature. So if your if your email provider has these two feature, then you you will be able to use this very very easily. Uh, in Udo, we use and catch all and email areas because it's simple that it's one business, one email account, and everything goes through Udo, and all the emails are received in Udo, and then every user and every email chat, every sales team, every project, every job has an email alias, and then you can everybody can have their own email account in Udo that doesn't have to be a real email account, and then you can use those email aliases through Udo using your email server. So probably on your email server, you just need to buy one catch-all account, and then you don't need to buy more account, and then you will be all set. So choose an email server that do support an email alias and catch-all feature. That's what we do recommend for full email uh, feature in Udo. Uh, of course, you can set up as many incoming and as many outgoing email server as you need, but by default, for outgoing, it will take the first outgoing, and for other things, it will not. Uh, for the other things, you have to go to email template and you have to set an alias. All right. 
Any questions after this, or shall we continue with the next thing? Um, Axel is asking if we can recommend some email servers that provide those features. I don't uh, know if I mean you can use Google Cloud, Google uh, Gmail account. They do provide that, and most of the email service providers do, uh, do that. But Office 365 is something they did. They don't provide this thing. So if you have uh, Office 365 or Zoho email, those people don't provide uh, this email alias and that mechanism. So that won't work. So, but most of the uh, big providers like uh, Google or uh, regular Microsoft Azure uh, email exchange server, those guys will do do provide this feature. So you can use those those as an email account with Udo, and that will work very nice. Of course, with our SaaS, we have our own email uh, services are running, and every instance on the SaaS gets their own email account on on. They will get one email with that instance. So they they actually don't need to buy any. Uh, email services when they use Udo SaaS. With, with your SaaS, we do provide an email service. Of course, it has a limitation that you cannot send infinite email. You will have a cap on how much you can send email to avoid the spam and everything. But if you are not spamming, then of course, we can increase your email limit and you can get more email limit from us. So if you're using Udo SaaS, you don't need to do that. If you're not, if you're, if you're self-hosted, Google or any other uh, pro email provider will do that. Uh, I mean, before making your call, just make make sure that those are two services that is supported by your provider, and that that will be all. Yeah, thank you. Uh, all right. All right, let's move ahead and let's talk about Ulu Studio customization and what happens behind the studio and what are the things that is happening behind the behind the curtains when you use the studio. So whenever you're using a studio, you will land on this home screen. Then you will once you will install Studio app, you will have this gear icons coming up right right on to the top right corner by username, you click over there. Uh, if I can interrupt you for a second, mm -hmm. would you zoom in your browser a little All bit? All right. Just so people watching on small screens can see you. That's perfect, thank you. All right, perfect. So once you click on this, all right, let me begin. So when you click on this uh, a gear icon, your screen will turn into gray. That means you are in edit mode right now. So let's say if you wanna add a new app, you just click a new app and then new app, and you can start creating a new app by giving uh, name this is my app for example let's say and then you you can use from existing model so let's say this app is all about sell order you can say sell order and you can use a sell order object to you know create using existing app or let's say uh, you want to create a commission module so you can say commission and then you can say sell dot uh, we can create a new object sell dot commission and sell dot commission and then you can introduce you can you can create fields through here also but let's say creating a field through here is not that fancy then you can use a drag and drop feature also that I'll I'll show you in a bit uh, also uh, if you're on your object if you want a ch chatter feature you just click mail thread save done and create your app and then you will you will have a commission app so let's let me close this quickly over here so as you could see on my home screen uh, I have a commission app and then once you have a commission app you can start creating commission and let's say uh, you want more field you want more field like let's say you want to call this commission is for which sell order or you want to say this commission is for which user so if you want to introduce more field you can introduce more field just by clicking studio and you see that there are multiple sections over here so there is a component section there's a new field section and then there's existing field section so component is just in view element to organize and organize your view. Let's say if you want to use a notebook page, then you can use a notebook page as many page as you want. You can introduce as many page as you want. Uh, or you, if you want to create a group, you can create a group. If you if you want to create a group by using a column, and you can of course have a column within column if you want. You can go as as complex as you want. I mean, it's 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 your choice, your call. So all right, let me let me keep this one. So either you choose from a new field. Now, when you do the new field, one of the things that you have to remember, remember that, uh, let's say if I want to create a relational. So before we go into new field, uh, let me explain you. In Uru, there are two kind of, uh, two category of the fields are there, simple field and relational field. Simple fields are like character, text, integer, float, each HTML, monetary. Uh, monetary is a float version of the field, uh, which is actually, filled with the currency. So it's a float field that bounds to currency. So you can have currency based float field, which which can automatically apply a currency conversion for you. So you can you can write a monetary field also in Udo. 
for that of course your object have to have a currency field if your object has a current currency field you can use a monitor over here you have date date and time you have boolean selection predefined selection of course you have binary where you can store all kind of a data and then you have a relational field so your relational field are one to many many to one and many to many so those are the relational fields that you can have now this has special type of a field the three fields that you hear they are like a modifier field so binary field if you want image field right so you can have binary field but that we with the widget image so whatever image that you upload will appear as an image section if you want tags then you can have a tags field by uh, just by drag and drop and of course if you want to have a selection field you can have a priority selection field and of course priority selection will have a predefined value that you want to define just to increase or decrease your priority of your if if there are any priority absolutely those are the star fields you see on, exactly uh, for example issues or issues help desk tickets. Ticket. Yep. correct correct and then existing field are these are the field that is already created on the object that we are playing around with so right now we are playing with the excel commission object so this commission object has this field are predefined how do you know if they are predefined or not? So simple, simple way of knowing this is go to your backend, make sure you are in debug mode. And let's say if I go to models, in the model, of course, it will create a new uh, model, sale commission. So sale commission is a model. So these are the predefined field. And because we have a chatter on our object, we have a lot of field about messages, which has to do with the chatter. So, uh, yep. If I want to introduce a chatter, I can also introduce a chatter on my on my view. It's it's simple as simple as drag and drop. All right. So I can choose from I can choose from this existing field, or I can I can create a new field. So let's say uh, I want to create a new field that uh, this commission is for which uh, which are orders. So simple thing is I can have many to one field in relation with which object. So it's it's in relation with sell order. So you say okay, it's in relation with sell order. And then once you have this field, you can of course choose in its properties by clicking on the properties. Require, required, if it's required, if you want to make it invisible, if you want to add a tooltip, let's say commission for order, that's an tooltip for this field. And more properties, domain, context, and everything can be defined over here. Of course, there are m multiple uh, options are available widget many to one selection whatever you feel is good for your choice then let's say you want to say this is for which user so this is commission is for sell order and this is for let's say user uh, which which salesperson so i want to call this as an salesperson salesperson close so now we can have a commission for person for sell order and then of course uh, some test value that you want to give now let's say you want amount field then if you want amount field of course it's pretty simple you go over here and you put a float field uh, I'm sorry it, it putting here will it's not a good idea because it will remove and label so I'll put it under the label uh, over here and I will call it amount and close. So now you can define commission and if you want those fields to be added in the tree view, so you just click on the tree view and go to existing field. In the existing field, you will have all those fields. Salesperson, <coughs> sorry, salesperson, and then you have uh, uh, amount field, which is amount right here, amount, commission amount to be paid. And you have sell order, then you can uh, you can have a sell order field, also sell order, right? And you just drag and drop, and you are all set. So this is now sales. Uh, this is now sell order for and salesperson and so forth. Now, while we are doing all of this, what happened? I mean, how did we? How did we? How did we create all this? So all these things are cre already created in the backend. Like when you drag and drop a new field onto the model, it creates a new field. So on, onto the model, you see there's a salesperson, many to one field created. Uh, then you have uh, amount field, which is actually your commission amount field, and so on and so forth. And they are marked as in custom field because they are customized field by the studio. And that way, when you export this, the whole when you export this as a whole module. So when I go in the studio, when I export this, when I export, 
what it will do is it will use it will do it will export all this customization directly which is importable in another database very easily so you can i mean if you want to create new field from here of course you can go ahead and you can create a new field let's say you want to create an sale amount uh, sale amount or order amount you can create order amount and this can be let's say float field and uh, this is required field for example and then you want to add another field order date and then you can say order date order date and let's say this is a uh, date and time field seven close seven close now this field will be automatically available on the studio if you create from the packet now what is the difference but if you do this way now if you if you create this field this way now th those field that you added right those fields are not part of studio right now so when you whenever you will export you will not give, get these fields out of Udo. but advantage over here is I mean, the fields name are simple it's easy to remember whenever you're writing a business logic automation business logic it becomes easy for you so let's say when I go here and in the views and if I want to create automation and if you want to create automated action let's say every time when a commission is created you want to send email to somebody uh, send an email on creation of a this thing and you can choose and sorry send an email and then you can choose and of course email you can choose an email template that you want to use on this object and then you can send an email now or if you are writing a python python code here writing a field name will be a bit difficult you have to remember all this field name either you have to copy them and then you have to do that I have a question. Mm -hmm. Can you change those names that Studio creates? Uh, the, this field names, usually we don't recommend doing this. Don't change them because those are most likely the real fields in the backend and they, they, they're more likely to break. If there, is no, if there is no data in there, then it's good. Then you can probably change it. I mean, if, if I do this way, if I do this, and assuming there is no data, it will not, assuming there is a data, it will not allow me that because I already entered data, it will not allow me editing those fill. So once you choose a fill, you probably cannot, you cannot modify the fill names that are generated, they'll be like that. What you can change probably is just an label. You can give whatever label you wanna, you wanna give, but no fill names can be changed. All right, next. All right, so those it creates and this fields and also of course it will it did create it when you when you are dra drag and dr whenever you are doing drag and drop on the view, it already it already created all the views that is needed. So when I say studio or so these are the view that is created for commission module. So this is a form view, and this is a tree view that is created for my object. So like so, every time when you create a new object, Studio will automatically create a default view with a name, and then every changes that you will do will be the inheritance, and then they will be, they will follow the same. Now with the newer Studio, that Studio 2.0, uh, there's a core improvement available. So before it used to create a multiple view for multiple inheritance, but now it doesn't do that. It just creates one view and it puts all changes in the one view. So it becomes easy for everybody. Uh, that's the thing. And also before in older studio, you could delete a field from the backend mm -hmm. while the field is still in the view. But with the newer studio, you cannot do that. So there's a, there is all these bugs that has been recovered. So newer studio is more robust and it's good for customization. And you can use that customization for online or on online or on site also. So essentially it creates all the views, actions and uh, menu item that is needed. So, let me quickly explain, of course, this, there are too many details to that, but let me quickly explain uh, things that what happened here. When you created a new app, it created this menu, it created a cell commission menu, it created this cell commission another menu, it created an action. So this is an action that is created. So if I wanna change a name, title of my action, I can of course say, go and change my title of my, uh, of my, and my action, and then I can improve the, I can improve my section over here, I can, I can let's say, you, I wanna increase instead of 80 record, I wanna see 160 record, I can see 160 record like this. And then I save and I refresh and it's done. So when you use Studio, it automatically creates a table, view, fields, actions, everything in the backend. You don't have to do that. It simplifies your job of doing that. So that's what, that's what happens behind the scene when you use a Studio. It creates a field, 
view action and automation of course you can also create automated action if you want to create automated action uh, any questions on this so far yeah we have two questions mm -hmm. the first one is from Axel Mendoza again uh, he's asking um, does Odoo Studio support the reference field and the company dependent field, uh, which he, in parentheses, says is the old property field? Uh, so Studio do, uh, Studio do support and related field, and it do support a company related field. Now remember, there is no related field anymore. What we have is a company default. So what you now any field can be property field. Okay, let me let me give you a background. Probably it's something new for you. But before in a previous version we have to have property field, we have to define a property field. And property field will hold a global data that is fact for your company. Mm -hmm. So for a partner, what is account receivable and payable, which is company company level thing. Yep. So for every partner, uh, receivable and payable is a company property field will have a generic value. But now with the newer framework, you don't have to define a property field. Every field is a company default, a company uh, property field. So what you do is you create a regular field, right? You let's say on my commission module, if I want to create a sell person is in property field, right? Uh, what I do is I go to settings, technical, and then there he's in company defaults. So under user defined, let me search it over here. Give you some defaults. Company properties. So under settings technical, there is a company properties. Over here, you can create a property field. You can create property, any field can be property field technically. So you don't need to create a property field. Ans and simple answer is any field can be property field. You just need to go to company property and use the name of name over has to be field. So let's say uh, for a X commission module, right? I want to create an X underscore, I want to use X underscore field. Uh, let's say sales person is in field. search more, sales person, and sell commission. So if I want to define the default value for this, let's say default value is two, right? So uh, field name is, you always give this field name as a name, and for which company? So that's, this is for your company. But for your company, sales person, company value is two. So by default, there will be always two. So when I go uh, into commission, and when I create two commission, what will happen is if I don't pass in value, right? The default default value will be set by a company default. It, so you can define any field can be turned into company defi company field, uh, company property field. So yeah, and related field of course you can always define a related field by studio, and let's say you want to create a character field, and that character field properties and click on the more, more will open this window in the more, uh, you have related field and then you can say user underscore ID dot, uh, uh, let's say state underscore ID dot name. So this is a related field. So when you, uh, uh, not user ID of course, it's a weird name of the field. So I, I need to get that field. X underscore commission, or X, X underscore sale. And the field will be here, user field will be this. So this is user field. So I want to get the user state. Uh, so this field dot state ID dot name, it's a pointer field. So now if I go back here, when I close this, uh, if there is, if this user has a state, state value defined, then I, I will have a state. Uh, let me see if I can quickly I mean, I cannot do it over here, but I have to go to partner form. So sales, sales, uh, customer, and here if I search demo, for a demo, demo portal user, uh, state is, there is no state, but let's say US, let's say state is California, if I save this, over here, uh, was it demo portal user? Yeah. Uh, wait, uh, that field is stored right now, so I have to define a depends. So what I need to do is one thing that I need to change is uh, let me drop that field over here. Uh, now let me switch back to this view because the field is in the list view. List view over here, over here, uh, more. 
because this field is stored right now, I have to define depends also. So every time when I change a username, I want it to be recalculated. So I do this, go over here and close this. And let's say from instead of demo, I want to set it to admin. So if you see admin has a Pennsylvania set as a, so admin Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania will come up. For other user, if I choose another user, if it has a state, then it will come up. So you can define a pointer field like that. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, let's move on to the next question. Uh, here's one from Muhammad. Uh, he's asking about, what about constraint? Um, I don't recall the exact context of that question. So, so constraint, so, so in Uru there are two kinds of constraint. Okay. Constraint is like a limitation. It's yeah. like a data validator. Like before you save your data, you, this is what you want to do, that is what, I, that is what you want to do. In Udo, you can write two kinds of a constraint, SQL constraint and Postgres, uh, sorry, uh, Python constraint. Now, of course, you cannot do uh, Postgres constraint just like that. It requires a little bit technical expertise to do that. But if you want to do Python constraint, you can definitely do Python constraint. You just go drop here. And let's say uh, amount has to be more than, it cannot be, more than 10% of the sale amount. If you want to write like that, you say automation, create, and then you say uh, check an amount, you say check amount, and then you say trigger on creation, and then you write a Python code, and then you write your business logic that my amount has to be this, and then you say raise a warning, and put your message right here. So this is equivalent to creating a constraint. Great, thank you. Um, let's move on to the next question. Um, Chowderpully is asking, what are controllers? Uh, we will have controllers.py in our module, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and what are they? Could you explain with an example? All right. So controllers are like HTTP routing. When you request, so when I go to my website, uh, when I go to my website, so as you could see on my screen, if I go to uh, my IP shop, right? The shop is requesting a data. So shop is in controller. Shop is an HTTP route endpoint where it, it takes in request. It can be get, it can be post, or it can be any kind of a request. So it, it's endpoint of for your HTTP request. Controllers, for example, if there is a, when I say shop, there will be a controller for the shop. So if I say, so if I go in my code, and if I go to website underscore sale module, I'm telling because I know this, but of course you can search in your code if you wanna search in your code. Uh, in the controller, in the main.py, there'll be, a, there'll be an, there will be an shop controller. So if I search for a slash shop, there will be controller. So in a, in a simpler term, see, this is HTTP route controller. So in a simple term, when you, when you request the shop page, right, your request will land over here. This is the controller which handles your request. So when you request, when a web client requests the data to the server, right, the request, because this is a domain name, and this is your request endpoint. So your request endpoint will be handled by the controller class. And that's why every, uh, every, every, every module that has a controller is a website module technically, or it has a website ability to that. Got it. So in basic terms, a controller points to... To uh, a piece of code, you can say. To a piece that. of code. To be triggered when you request the data. And then that piece of code will render a template, it will render a view, or it will render more information, it, depending on your business logic. Got it, great, thank you. Uh, sure. Pali, let us know if that uh, answers your question or if you have any follow-up questions. Um, but in the meantime, uh, let's move on to the next question. Here's one from RP. Uh, he's asking, can you back up the actual Odoo system somehow, not the database, uh, so that if something happens to your server physically, uh, you can clone it someplace else, uh, presumably to save all your server settings, all your deployment settings. Um, is there a way to back that up somehow? I mean, you you technically don't need to back up and uh, back up and hold thing, because whenever you are running a server, what what technically you are running is you are running piece of code which is hosted on the GitHub. So Udo code will be on the GitHub. Your code will be your customized code will be on the GitHub, for example, or SVN or whatever repository you use, right? Your code will be there. What technically you need is just a backup to be able to you know run it again when 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 it crashes. But of course, if you if you want to create a hot server, then there is n there is nothing that we provide that you can make a clone of the Udo whole server running server environment. 
So either you have to use and duplicate uh, disk, so that just copies the whole mirror disk using a uh, SATA configuration. It creates a mirror disk so that way if your one disk fails, another disk will be hot disk. So you can swap to another disk and it will it will be keep running as it is. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, Mohammed is asking if we can slow down a little bit, and this is a concern for all webinars, and I can address this a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great feedback, and thank you. We appreciate that. Uh, we are rushing to get through a lot of content today, so yeah. this one in particular is pretty fast, and I apologize. But know that you can always go back and watch the recording. Um, you can watch it on half speed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, or you can shoot us a follow-up question at events at odoo.com, uh, and we can, uh, I can explain via email uh, if that's an easier way to ingest information. Yeah, um, no, but anyway, yeah. thank you for your feedback. We appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Here is a... Oh, you know what? I have been remiss in addressing this. We had a question earlier from mm -hmm. Billy Kosak mm -hmm. um, about the API. Mm -hmm. I know we didn't cover that, but could you maybe address this uh, just in brief? Uh, and his use case is that he's receiving items uh, from purchase orders mm -hmm. via the API. Mm -hmm. um, and when they receive them, if there's a missing item, he is trying to figure out how to create a back order using right. the API. Right. and. If this opens up a whole big can of worms that we don't have time for, uh, just let me know. Yeah, it's it's a big thing, but I'll quickly run through it to explain in bits and pieces of it. So when you receive a product, what happens technically is uh, for incoming shipment, when you receive and things, this is your incoming shipment, uh, this is your original demand. So this is what you originally demanded for, for every picking, Technically, it creates a pick pack operation. So with the API, let's say if your picking is receiving a list information, right? So technically, you have to write a inform uh, you have to write an API call to first on this pack operation reduce the quantity to done. Got it. So you reduce this quantity. So instead of thirty five, I'm receiving thirty only. So this is what you receive receive. Now when you do when you receive a list quantity, right? There is a business logic which has to be treated. So there is a method called do new transfer which I can guide. Is you can go to uh, github.com slash udo slash udo and version 10 add-ons stock uh, model and in there we have an called stock picking ty in there we have a definition call so if you hover over over here valley you will see that uh, this is do new transfer this calls a method do new transfer so if you search for uh, method call sorry uh, down here if you search for uh, do new transfer this is the method right which does that thing so if if the if there is a partial order right what it does it will it will create a stock dot pack dot operation so it will create a stock dot pack dot operation this object so it will create in this object and then it will call a wizard which technically is which technically calls and wizard down here. So you have to create a wizard in your API call, which is uh, stock.packorder.confirmation. You create stock.pack.order.confirmation. And in that, you find your picking ID, and you call method called process. So when you call this process method, it will automatically create. So it will automatically mark your quantity that you have set to do as in done. It will, it's, you have to simulate this process. When you click validate, it creates in this wizard. Right, so you have to if it's a back order, then you have to you have to create a new stock dot back order dot confirmation object, and then you have to pass with the picking ID, and then you call process method, and when you click that, it will mark your your picking to be done, and it will create a back order. So if I go back, there will be a back order of two with the five as an to do thing. So it's kind of a complicated, but thing in short, you have to call a wizard, and you have to call a button on the wizard. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Veli, uh, hopefully that answers your question. And as a reminder, you can go back and review this recording at any time at the same URL, uh, so you can reference back to that. I know we did rush through it a little bit. Uh, let's see, let's move on to the next question now. Uh, we are just about out of time, but let's see if we can get through everything. Um, here's a follow-up question from Axel Mendoza. He says, 
uh, let's see, I'm just going to reference back to your first question that uh, asking about the reference field and the company dependent field, aka the old property field. Mm -hmm. um, he says that he means with the reference field, uh, the field that it's composed of with allowed models selection and the records many to one. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, you can do that. Definitely, uh, you can you can choose. You can say uh, so. Of course, you cannot add that field through here. There is no provision in the studio to add this field. So to do so, you have to go into the backend. So you go into the models and onto the models. Um, let's say x underscore sale underscore commission over here. You add in field and uh, which is of type uh, reference. You create a reference field. And in the reference field here, you provide a list of uh, models that you want to filter on. So let's say you want to give cell order as a reference. So you give cell order, and you say cell, cell, cells. And then let's say you want to give an partner as a reference. So you can give partner as a reference, rds.partner, uh, partner. So you can make a reference field like this, and you say ref two RDS, uh, ref as in field, reference as in close, as in close. So this creates a reference field which can refer to two objects at the same time, which allows referencing multiple objects if you want to make a reference to multiple objects. So it's a many to one field, but with a multiple table at the same time. So you can choose from multiple table if you want to. So in, in our commission module, if I, if I were to view form, if I were to drop that field that we just created, So this is the field that we just created. Oh, I mean, this field cannot be placed over here. Probably I messed up with the view, but I can go to form view and I can put that field over here. And then you can reference to any free object that you want to refer to. So it's like you define a list of object and then you can choose a record that you want to choose to. And you can define like that. OK, great. So it's, it's, it's available. But it's not, you cannot do through the, through the studio. Great. Um, let's see. Uh, let's move on to the next question now. Um, uh, here's another follow-up question from Mohammed, uh, Muhammad Usman Anwar. Let's see. Let me just scroll up briefly to your uh, first question. But uh, while I look into that, we had a question um, actually in our last webinar about uh, how to add a calculated field using uh, two date time fields. Basically, uh, this was on our help desk webinar, and the question was how to add a field to a ticket that tells you how long it has been since uh, that ticket was created. I mean, yeah, sure, we can do that. I mean, to, to do so, probably let me take an existing record field data that we, we can refer back. So to do so, of course, you need to know date and time library, and you need to write some kind of uh, business logic over here. Uh, but let me see. All right, so with for a date and time only, you cannot write a compute field to make a difference of a days. So for that, you need a server action. Because in the, in the server action, we have a different set of library, which is not access, accessible on the compute field. Because to do the date and time difference, like start date into last update date and what, what today minus whatever days, that requires an extra library operation, Python library operation, which is not available on the compute field right now. So you cannot do that particular date and time operation using compute. Probably you need to write a server action to do that. Okay, great, thank so you. So you can write a server action. In the server action, if you wanna see quickly, I can tell you is this. Uh, uh, write a P any object, write code, and then see you see there's a date and time and date date and time and date util and time zone library available. So I can say, so what happens here is when you access a date field from the database, right? Udo will return a string date. And you cannot deduct string date from the string date. It in Python it's not possible. So you need to convert that string into the date and time object. So both string has to be converted into date and time object and then you can deduct them. So technically you can say date and time date and time dot date and time dot strp time and your 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 date and time uh, record dot uh, date field goes here 
and then you say minus uh, date and time dot date and time dot now or today right and this will uh, this will give you an deductions of a days and then you can say dot days like so and this will give you a number of days that you wanna you want and then you can store directly onto the field great thank you so much um, so I while you were answering that, I looked into Mohammed Usman Anwar's question, and it looks like it's not a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, but he's asking about uh, an example with project management to create uh, project review and endorsement, and then approval to launch the project. Um, sounds like a, a business case. Can you, let's see. Yeah, it looks you know, uh, I don't know that we actually have time to get into that, because we are actually six minutes over time. Um, so I am going to wrap it up here uh, and answer briefly to Gregory Dover's question. Uh, if we can, um, let's see, just curious, can questions and answers be discussed or discussed in the chat be made available for review later? Uh, Gregory, this recording is posted. Uh, you can review this recording at any time uh, at this same URL. So you can come back and watch any of this. The live chat is not recorded. I've done my best to talk through um, every single question that we addressed. So hopefully that will be there uh, and be sufficient to uh, fully follow the conversation that we're having. Um, but yeah, so so feel free to review this at, at any time. Yep, yep. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Todd to uh, take us out. Um, cool. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. This uh, concludes our webinar for the day. Um, and I just wanted to mention, as Clark has said several times, you know, this URL is available, so you can review it at any time. Um, and if you have any additional questions that you would like answered, just send an email to events uh, at odoo.com, or you can also find out about future webinars as well. So Great. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Uh, right. We wouldn't be here without our our community of users and developers, partners. Um, we uh, absolutely appreciate you all coming out today. And all with right. that, I'm going to go ahead and turn off the stream in just about a second here. Cool. <laughs> Take care. See you guys. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.